This is the Sanat Kumara. Welcome to the 61st lecture of Namas University, Earth Spiritual Digital University, the place and community that grows you into fully soul-guided and Shambhala-assisted human beings. It is my turn again in Lessons 61 to 64. We will talk about Earth's higher dimensional connections, how it all began, what purposes Lemuria and Atlantis served, how this period of Earth still affects all, and what our way forward looks like for you. These lessons are provided through Martina and are spoken by Deborah Lee Flynn. Today we start with how it all began. When you study all the ruins artifacts, bones, and theories about Earth's and human history available, you will find many stories and opinions. No matter how detailed they are, they don't show a complete picture of events. A fractured, third-dimensional consciousness and a consciousness that divides between light and darkness, good and evil, us and them in any form, cannot discover an all-including truth known by our common source, our divine origin. But the more conscious you become, the more information is available to your library of mind. The more complete also becomes the story of our common roots, past, present, and future. Earth and all who live on and in Earth moved through four major stages before the shift began in 2012. The shift is the fifth step before we can think about Earth taking on its mission as a spiritual university planet for our galaxy. Step one was Earth coming into existence, testing functionalities. At the beginning, there was a conscious decision to create a spiritual university planet for our galaxy, and that was part of the Divine's plan. That was the starting point, and intention was set. Invitations were sent out near and far by the Divine, or however you prefer to call our common origin, to contribute to this planet. At that time, our solar system was already developing. The Sun was its most advanced celestial body. Project Earth received firm contribution commitments for plants, minerals, animals, deva, human, and humanoid DNA from peoples and various life forms on other planets. Higher dimensional beings you have never heard of generously answered the call to contribute. The devas designed Earth once they had a complete overview of what contributions were available. They designed the planet in the etheric and brought it into existence in the fourth dimension. This already included the connections to the cosmic communication system for humans, nature beings, and off-earth allies. The connection to the Divine's cosmic communication system forms part of each celestial body. Then testing started in the fourth dimension. After the planet was stable and all seemed to function well, animals, deva, and human beings of all kinds came in to test out various bodies. Once that had reached a satisfactory level, the planet, with all its life forms, was lowered into the third dimension. Many more rounds of testing were needed in the third dimension. 
human bodies were tested by incarnated aspects of souls from the Pallades, Sirius, and the Orion in the water, later on land. That development took a very long time. It included a long list of failures and learnings. Human bodies of the third dimension were, and still are, rather limited in their conscious capabilities and rigid maneuver. The testing process was tedious and slow. The most difficult thing was to keep a stable connection between the incarnated aspect and its soul. It worked well in the fourth dimension, but in the third dimension only for the divine feminine aspect. For the planet itself, polarity and duality were established. The north and south pole stood for the polar tension. Lemuria in the east and Atlantis in the west, representing the divine feminine and divine masculine aspect, created the first duality. Together, the north and south pole, Lemuria and Atlantis, formed the four energetic pillars of Earth. Over time, more high cultures, like the Mayan or Tibetan, were established to add to Earth's development. The original creation of new life by human beings living in the dense physical world followed the reproductive mode of birds. This is stored in the collective unconscious of humanity. The collective unconscious formed the fact pool of many creation myths that see the egg at the beginning. In many creation myths, the universe hatches from an egg. The Indian Vedas tell of Brahmanda, the egg of Brahma, which contains the world of creation. The Chinese creator, Pangu, creates heaven and earth by breaking an egg. The egg stands for the origin, the simple, the source. Easter in the Christian belief system hints at that beginning in renewal as well, but with a different intention. However, the first human who lived on land in the dense physical of the third dimension to create in accordance with Earth's plan for humans was a woman. The divine, God, Allah, Brahma, etc., impregnated her with divine creative power. She was a higher dimensional being as well as an incarnate aspect in the third dimension. Depending on which story in the various cultures you consult, her name was either Lilith, Goddess Amaterasu, Goddess Shivangmu, and many others more. She gave birth to a son who was formed from her womb. The Christian culture calls him Adam. This divine insemination, the divine fertilization method, repeated itself about 2,000 years ago with Mother Mary and her son, Yeshua. But back again to the start and the initial divine immaculate birth, Fast forward from that thousands of years and earth was populated by cultures of various levels of consciousness. Yet the earth's surface looked very different than what you are used to now. The two main high cultures the spiritual world talks about, Lemuria and Atlantis, partly overlapped with each other in their time of existence. They form the second step in Earth's development. Lemuria was the first high culture to come into existence. It was taken down intentionally to connect the divine feminine abilities with the divine masculine of the Atlantean culture. Atlantis fell for another reason, but we get to both high cultures in Lessons 62 and 63. Both cultures still exist in higher dimensions as well as underneath the current ocean floor. That is why some of you 
can access them. How much you can access depends on whether this is part of your soul's planetary mission, the vastness of your library of mind, and your manner of evaluating multidimensional time-space reality. Thousands of articles and books are available about the divine masculine culture of Atlantis, a lot less about the first high culture, Lemuria. The word Lemuria consists of four segments. Together, they describe the meaning of this first high culture on Earth. Le means the blessed. Mu means land. Ri means cooing, laughing, happiness. And A means that has everything. Thus, Lemuria is the blessed land of cooing, laughing, happiness that has it all. Lemuria was the paradise garden of the divine feminine, washed around by the sea of peace. It was in full contact with the divine source, and all life was centered around that direct connection, how to live it and how to understand it further. What did not happen in the Lemurian culture was individual creation, divine masculine expression, based on one's own free will. This divine masculine aspect only came into full existence in Atlantis. Atlantis was the divine masculine counterpart to Lemuria. The divine masculine creates based on its own free will whether connected and fully aligned with the receiving divine feminine or not. Atlantis literally means the island of Atlas. Atlas was a titan, a pre-Olympian god, who was condemned to hold up the sky for eternity. This shows that life on earth was very much connected to our cosmic brethren, who played a vital part in our planet's development experiencing both light and darkness in creating. I will talk about these cosmic connections, crossbreeding, and much more in the next four lessons I hold as of mid-June 2024. That whole process took a very long time and was full of failures. In the high culture of Atlantis, free will to create was the divine gift provided that needed to be mastered. If free will is used in accordance with the receiving divine feminine aspect of an incarnated being, it is in line with the divine plan for earth. If not, one gathers experience and most of that experience is painful and dark. The risk of creating without divine connection was taken into account In fact, it was part of the learning process. How else can you become a spiritual university planet for our galaxy if you have not mastered all the learning that is available in the galaxy as well? When Lemuria went down, part of its population relocated to Atlantis. The failure to connect the higher Lemurian energies of the Divine Feminine to the lower Atlantean of the Divine Masculine resulted in painful learnings and eventually in a downfall of Atlantis. What I would like you to understand today are two things. Testing and failure were and are part of learning. Even today, they prepare you for the use of your divine innate abilities. Secondly, All that was experienced on Earth since testing started is stored in humanity's collective unconscious. The collective unconsciousness is made up of content which regardless of historic era or social or ethnic group are the deposit of mankind's typical reactions to universal human situations on Earth. These reactions can be fear, anger, the desire to control, 
of the struggle against superior powers, but also the willingness to integrate peacefully, the willingness to forgive, and many more. It includes the relations between the sexes, between children and parents, with other beings of divine origin, the relations between love and hate, birth and death, power of the light and the dark principle. If you study humans' collective unconsciousness in the form of the archetypes as described and explained by Carl Gustav Jung, you learn that each archetype has a light and a shadow side. And a person only becomes whole by integrating one's shadow side into the light. That is the challenge we face in the shift until 2032. Let's take the archetype of the seeker as an example. The light part of the archetype of a seeker refers to someone who searches on a path that begins with earthly curiosity but has at its core the search for one's divine source, one's soul, personal and planetary mission. The shadow part of this archetype emerges when a seeker is disconnected from his divine feminine receptive abilities and, with it, disconnected from the soul, the personal and planetary mission. If that is the case, then the disconnect stretches further to a disconnection from all others living on and in Earth, to Earth's purpose, and to the unity of life within the cosmos as well. Our path to unity as one human family on this planet, our path to unity with all life that calls Earth home in the five kingdoms, our path to unity with our cosmic brethren requires that we overcome the behavioral blueprints of our past until the end of the shift from the third to and through the fifth dimension in 2032. All that has happened since the early days was allowed and considered a potential of learning and developing earth in all life that calls earth home including its off-earth connections. Now, during the shift until 2032, we are in the process of leaving the dark times since the fall of Atlantis behind us, not by fighting or ignoring darkness, but by integrating it. And that integration needs to take place in each individual of all kingdoms and in all dimensions. No being can escape it, no matter how hard it tries. For that to happen, myths must be debunked. Hidden knowledge has to be revealed. The beings of the deva, animal, plant and mineral, as well as the Conry and Oblon kingdom, must become visible and tell their part of the story as well. My colleagues from all five kingdoms teaching at Namas University play a vital role in that. The Deva Master teachers just gave you a first taste of it in Lessons 58 to 60. A lot more will be coming this year. Next week, in Lesson 62, we will explore life on and the workings of Lemuria. Until then, do me and all life on earth a favor. Spread this Lesson 61 far and wide. Invite your friends and family to get to know Earth and its workings better. Namas University is the only place that offers you such a comprehensive view on life and our common future. I finish with a call for help to get all teaching material from stories to documentaries out to as many students in English, German, Hindi, Russian, and soon more languages. Martina and I are in the process of building a Namash University translator team. 
we are looking for language professionals who volunteer to work with us. We need an English mother tongue who is fluent in German and preferably in one more language who will work directly with Martina. We need another language professional with German mother tongue for proofreading and translators for English into Hindi and Russian. We are also looking for someone with a publishing background to help with the technical part and who will coordinate all translations. If any of my needs speak to you from your soul, please contact Martina through the contact button, University, on my website, thesanakumara.com. I would like to end this lesson with a warm-hearted, huge blessing and hug for all working selflessly at Namas University so that we are able to serve humanity. I am proud of this team. I am proud of how you welcome new colleagues into the team. I am proud of how you kindly integrate them with open arms. I am proud of how you support each other unconditionally. I am proud of how you grow with each other, both in skills needed, but also in expanding consciousness. It is a joy to work with you. That is all I wanted to share with you today. My love and blessings to all. This was the Sanat Kumara. Kumara Satsanga Kumara Satsanga Kumara Satsang